Finishing Thanksgivings. Uh, we're talking today about uh, rational medicine, and um, really what we're talking about is how an understanding of the molecular biology of disease has actually helped one to revolution, has helped to revolutionize the uh, new science of therapeutic medicine. And here, more often than not, the discussions are focused around cancer. And so I will therefore uh, talk about an interesting story vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the treatment of the modern treatment of cancer and how our understanding of the molecular biology of the disease really helps um, <clears throat> in developing uh, radically new kinds of therapies. By way of background, um, let's just mention that most of the chemotherapeutics that we use today to treat cancer were developed over the last 40 to 50 years at a time when the molecular and biochemical defects inside cancer cells were totally obscure. And therefore, to the extent that one developed chemotherapeutics, they were developed simply empirically, trial and error. For example, um, some of the most effective chemotherapeutics against childhood leukemia are alkylating agents. which attach methyl and ethyl groups to uh, target molecules inside cells. And their utility in cancer was first discerned because of a, uh, an explosion in, <clears throat> in a container, I think it was in a ship off Naples in World War II, where a, a bin of alkylating agents was dispersed. Many people were exposed to it. And these people, as a consequence of that, came down with what's called leukopenia. Penia generally means a depression, in this case a depression of their white blood cells. Such alkylating agents had actually been used during the First World War in, in gas warfare, because during the First World War uh, one used what so-called mustard gases. which was in a very effective way, even more effective than artillery, in killing vast numbers of uh, enemy soldiers. And uh, somebody noticed this leukopenia in 1946-47 as a consequence of inadvertent exposure to these alkylating agents, which became dispersed as a gas. And about five years later, somebody made the logical leap that if these agents were able to suppress normal white blood um, <coughs> concentrations, that perhaps they might also be effective against what seemed to be ostensibly a related uh, problem, which is the problem of leukemia. And keep in mind that when we talk about leukemia, the, the suffix emia refers to blood, generally, and leuk, uh, once again, refers to white blood, i.e. an excess of white blood cells in the, in, the, um, in the blood. And so through this accidental discovery, one began to develop alkylating agents that turned out to be extremely successful in treating and often curing childhood leukemias, most notably acute lymphocytic leukemia, which turns out to be very sensitive to this and other related agents. So this is a very common form of childhood leukemia, which is now actually cured in 60 or 70 percent of the children who were treated which would have been unheard of half a century ago. But I return to what I said before, which is that this kind of treatment was developed in the face of total ignorance concerning the nature of the disease, the molecular defects that were present in the disease and that were responsible for the runaway, can you still hear me okay? Uh, we're, we're responsible for the runaway proliferation of the cancer cells. So having said that, I wanna to go to a different kind of leukemia uh, and this is called chronic myelogenous leukemia, to give you an indication of the path of discovery that led from um, its original uh, uh, description. To uh, the development of rather successful treatments. So chronic light myelogenous leukemia, uh, I mentioned the prefix myelo last time or the time before referring to bone marrow, and this is a, a leukemia of cells coming from the bone marrow, uh, from the uh, myeloid cells in the bone marrow, which are the precursors of things like um, 
macrophages, and granulocytes. So these are cells which are playing an important role in, our, in the immune response. And, uh, and during this chronic myelogenous leukemia disease, which is called CML, there could be a period of three or four years where individuals develop large numbers of these cells in their, in their bloodstream. And after a period of about three or four years, all of a sudden there is an eruption into what's called blast crisis. And you may recall I mentioned the word blast also on one occasion earlier. This all fits together in a nice puzzle. Blast refers to primitive embryonic-like cells. And all of a sudden, there's an eruption of a primitive embryonic-like cells, less differentiated, like these macrophages and granulocytes, which until this point had been present in vastly excessive numbers in the blood. There's blast crisis. There's acute. This leads to acute myelogenous leukemia. And, uh, and death ensues usually within a year or two, or has, that's been traditionally the case. No one really had any idea about the possible causative mechanisms of the disease, and that allows me to use another word which you might one day come across if you should stay in biomedical research, and that is the etiologic agents. When we talk about etiologic agents, we talk about the agents which are causally responsible for inducing a disease. These can be external agents, or they could even be internal agents, molecules inside cells, which are responsible for the creation of, of the disease. And the, the key discovery was made in 1960 when individuals were looking at the chromosomal makeup of the CML cells. The chromosomal makeup, I'll use another word just so we can expand our vocabulary this morning. The chromosomal makeup is often called the karyotype. That is to say, the constellation of chromosomes that one can see at mitosis, at mitosis under the microscope. Keep in mind, as we've said before, that during the interphase of the cell cycle, chromosomes are essentially invisible. But during the metaphase of mitosis, they become condensed. And on that occasion, individuals noticed a 9 to 22 translocation. So here. Here is uh, chromosome 9, normally. Here's chromosome 22. And as you may know, uh, the numbering system with human chromosomes goes from the largest, number 1, all the way down to the smallest. So this is, uh, almost, this is the smallest, with the exception of the Y chromosome. And what they noticed was instead of seeing this regular uh, chromosomal array, they noticed instead what looked very much like a structure of this sort here. Um. I.e., a translocation. And this translocation resulted in a swapping of sequences between these two chromosomes. Note, by the way, this is reciprocal, i.e., in the sense that this chrome, 9 donates something to 22, and 22 donates something to, to 9. However, uh, the, the segments that are swapped are not necessarily of equal size. So it turns out here that in this case, chromosome 9 has actually gained a lot more than chromosome 22 gained as a consequence of, of this exchange of genetic uh, segments. And this 922 chrom uh, translocation made the smallest chromosome even smaller. So this was already the smallest chromosome, as I mentioned, be the, besides the, the, the smallest autosome, the smallest non-sex chromosome. Now it got even smaller because it lost some of its, its bulk as a consequence of this chromosomal translocation. And because this discovery was made in Philadelphia. It became known as the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, this is now about 40 years ago, or as it's sometimes called, PH1, for reasons. I don't know why it's called PH1, except for Philadelphia. And as investigators began to look at other cases of chronic myelogenous leukemia, they discovered that this 
translocation was present, and the Philadelphia chromosome, most importantly, was identifiable in virtually all cases, more than 95% of the cases of chronic myelogenous leukemia. And moreover, th this chromosome was at present as well in the more differentiated uh, macrophages and granulocytes that were present in, uh, and circulating in the blood of uh, the CML patients. And that began to suggest the notion that there was a stem cell of some sort, an oligopotential stem cell that could create various kinds of more differentiated white blood cells that had sustained this chromosomal translocation, because that's what it is, a, uh, a translocalization, a translocation, that, it, it, that, that all the cells of these patients had, under, had, had sustained this chromosomal translocation. And that began to suggest the notion that somehow as a consequence of a random genetic accident happening in these people's blood, this particular uh, chromosome was repeatedly identified, and that it was, was with great likelihood causally or etiologically important in the genesis of the disease. But that in itself led nowhere, one could simply say, uh, talk about its association, until work from a totally unrelated area, which is to say uh, the study of retroviruses, discovered Abelson Abelson uh, murine leukemia virus. And Abelson was named after the fellow Herb Abelson, who first discovered it at NIH and undertook its molecular characterization here in our own cancer center. And uh, Abelson discovered that this virus, which he had he, he studied, carried the ends of the uh, murine leukemia virus, which was the parental virus. It was a hybrid virus. And into the middle of it, Abelson leukemia virus had acquired a cellular proto-oncogene, which, which it had activated into an oncogene. And therefore, here we have a situation where a cellular gene, like SARC in the case of Rouse sarcoma virus, has been activated. It's called, this became called ABL for obvious reasons. And this gene, it turned out, was uh, critically important in um, understanding how the chromosomal translocation led to cancer. In fact, if one infected um, <coughs> mice with a, a retrovirus carrying this genome, this is just uh, to indicate the fact that the ends of the, the repeat ends, the long terminal repeat ends of this provirus, they occur twice at the ends of this retrovirus. If one infected a, uh, a mouse with the Abelson virus, out came a disease which was quite re superficially similar, at least, to, to uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And that began a search then for the chromosomal localization of the able proto-oncogene. And what was discovered subsequently, fascinatingly enough, was that the able proto-oncogene was right at the breakpoint um, between uh, the uh, <clears throat> two chromosomes 9 and 22. And what happened as a consequence of this translocation and the resulting fusion of this chromosome with this chromosome was the creation of a fused gene, a hybrid gene, that now carried the reading frames of two previously unconnected genes, one on chromosome 9 and one on chromosome 22. Here's the normal ABLE protein. It's called C-ABLE, meaning the cellular or the normal form of ABLE. And you can see it up here. It's shown in a very schematic way. And here's the uh, form of the, here's a second protein, which is encoded on the other chromosome. So one of the, uh, so ABL is encoded here. And the other gene, which is called BCR, is encoded here. And as a consequence of the translocation, ABL is encoded here, BCR is encoded here. As a consequence of the translocation, one now has not only the fusion of chromosomal segments, but one has the fusion of the reading frames of two previously unlinked genes. And here one creates, as, as a consequence of these fusions, any one of a series of three quite distinct fusion proteins, which did not, do not naturally pre-exist in the normal cell. Um, and they're shown here as P185, P210, and P230. These translocations allow 
different parts of a second gene called BCR. BCR refers to breakpoint cluster region. The, the area, the point of fusion is called the breakpoint between the two genes. So the, the point where each gene is cut and fused with the other is called the breakpoint. And it turns out that within the region of the chromosome where BCR maps, there's actually three sites at which the fusion can occur. If you look carefully at this diagram, you see that there's differing extents of the BCR protein, uh, which can be contributed to the fusion protein. Some, and what this says in effect is the following, that here, let's just refer to this diagram right up here. N notice, by the way, in all three of these that the, that the ABLE protein is present at the C-terminal end of the protein, the BCR is present at the N-terminal end. So here's, here's the BCR gene. Here's the ABLE gene down here. And what investigators found is that there could be a break at this part of the BCR gene, at this part of the BCR gene, or at this part of the BCR gene, resulting always in the fusion of ABLE to one or two or three different kinds of BCR proteins. And breakpoint cluster region signified the fact that there was a whole cluster of sites in the previously existing BCR gene to which this fusion could take place, resulting if the, if the break occurred here, the breakpoint occurred here in BCR, you get the longer one. Here you get this, uh, the medium-sized one, and here you get the shortest one. And interestingly enough, as one explored virtually uh, uh, other kinds of different leukemias, one could see different um, of these fusion proteins that were produced. Here's chronic myelogenous leukemia, which I talked to you about before. Here is acute lymphocytic leukemia. And here's chronic neutrophilic uh, leukemia, three, three different kinds of leukemia. We don't have to worry about the details of these diseases, aside from the fact to say that, that the structure of this fusion protein encourages the outgrowth of different kinds of stem cells in the bone marrow, which in turn create three different kinds of diseases. Most importantly for our discussion was an attempt to understand the nature of the resulting fusion protein, which as a consequence of this fusion caused by the chromosomal translocation, now clearly acquired biological powers that did not pre-exist in either of the two parental proteins. These various notations here indicate a whole series of different functions which are associated with the ABLE protein and alternatively with the, uh, BC, uh, with the BCR protein. And we don't need to get into them except to say that each one of these different names here allows the protein on its own to associate with the other proteins and to activate a downstream signaling cascade. What's most important about our discussion is the realization that this SH1 domain indicated here, SH1 refers to the sarcomology domain, equals sarcomology, equals a tyrosine kinase. And therefore, what one has here is a protein which is much more elaborate than SARC, has vastly more sing signaling capabilities by virtue of the fact that these different domains that are indicated here allow the resulting fusion protein to grab a hold of a whole bunch of different signaling partners so that it can send out a diverse array of downstream uh, activating signals. If one examined the structure of the uh, SH, uh, SH1 domain, it had a, a, a tyrosine kinase activity very much like SARC. And most importantly, if one introduced this fusion protein into a, a retrovirus, now instead of BCR, uh, now instead of ABLE, one could make a BCR ABLE fusion protein. One could put this into a retrovirus as before, just like up here. One could infect mice with it and now get out a disease which was indistinguishable, in, in essence, from uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia in humans. If one put a subtle point mutation in the tyrosine kinase domain of the ABLE protein, here's the tyrosine kinase domain, SH1 up here, here we see the tyrosine kinase domains represented in the three different fusion proteins. Keep in mind SH1 is always the tyrosine kinase domain. If one put a subtle inactivating point mutation in the tyrosine kinase domain, 
that in immediately wiped out all biological powers of creating um, leukemias on the part of this retrovirus here or any one of the other closely related kinds of fusion proteins. And therefore that indicated that the tyrosine kinase domain indicated right here was really critical to creating the, the tumor uh, and that any effects on its uh, tyrosine kinase signaling ability would in the end result in the collapse of, of uh, the tumor or the inability of the resulting retrovirus to actually create cancer. And so now one had uh, really for the first time a clear demonstration of how a commonly occurring human uh, cancer, chronic myelogenous leukemia is unfortunately not so rare, could arise as a consequence of some random chromosomal translocation event. You might ask, why, do the one, why does one always get this particular kind of translocation? Well, the point, uh, the answer is we don't really know. It, it would almost seem as if there's a homing device which causes this fr fragment and this fragment to target each other and to exchange one another. It's probably not the case. What probably happens is that chromosomal translocations take place rather randomly within the bone marrow. And on rare occasion, there is a chromosomal translocation that creates exactly this kind of fusion. And this kind of fusion, in turn, is what's responsible for creating this fusion protein. And this fusion protein, in turn, creates the outgrowth of these, this, uh, this CML, the chronic myelogenous leukemia disease. So what that means is really that a randomly occurring chromosomal translocation on rare occasion hits a genetic jackpot, and the cell which happens to have acquired this kind of chromosomal translocation now begins to proliferate wildly, creating first chronic myelogenous leukemia, and then subsequently erupting into a, a, a subsequent acute phase where there are seemingly additional genetic alterations beyond this chromosomal translocation that conspire with the initially present chromosomal translocation to create a, a very aggressive disease which rapidly leads to the death of the leukemia patient. That offered, in principle, an attractive way of beginning to develop an anti-cancer uh, therapeutic because what one might uh, imagine was that one could develop a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Now keep in mind that tyrosine kinases are a class of uh, enzymes which attach phosphate groups onto the tyrosine residues of um, various substrate proteins. And keep in mind as well the fact that we drew a series of growth factor receptors which have tyrosine kinase domains in them. And I'm drawing the tyrosine kinase domains here, like this. That when these growth factor receptors become activated, they attach phosphate groups onto the tails of one another. And I'll draw those, those phosphate groups like this. i.e. the binding of ligand, of, let's say epidermal growth factor ligand or platelet-derived growth factor ligand, causes the two uh, receptors, which are normally mobilized in the plane of the membrane, plasma membrane, to come together to transphosphorylate one another, and having done so, to, to acquire actively signaling powers, because once these phosphates become attached, they now represent sites where other molecules can anchor themselves and send out downstream signals. In fact, there are altogether 90 different tyrosine kinases in, uh, encoded in the human genome. And so, to the extent that these tyrosine kinases become hyperactivated in various kinds of human cancers, this represents, in principle, a very attractive way of De developing an anti-cancer therapeutic. But let's think about the problems that are inherent in such a, uh, a compound. First of all, if one wants to develop an anti-cancer therapeutic, it must be reasonably specific for the Abelson tyrosine kinase and not the many other kinds, 89 kinds of tyrosine kinases that also coexist in the human genome and are active and apparently responsible for normal cell metabolism in a whole variety of normal cell types. So one has to begin to think about the issue of selectivity. 
how can one possibly make a low molecular weight compound which is selectively able to inactivate the Abelson uh, t um, tyrosine kinase, as indicated here, the SH1 group, but doesn't disturb a whole variety of other tyrosine kinases um, <clears throat> that are responsible for other normal physiological mechanisms. Well, you say that's pretty easy. We have 90 different genes. Each of the 90 different genes makes a distinct protein, and these proteins should be very different. And therefore, if one can, in fact, if one does the three-dimensional structure of these proteins, all the tyrosine kinases look quite similar. They, they have a bilobed structure. Here is the active site of the enzyme. That is to say, in here is the catalytic cleft, the site where the actual catalysis takes place, the site where the gamma phosphate of ATP is taken from the ATP and attached to a substrate protein, to the hydroxyl of a tyrosine of a protein that's about to be phosphorylated. So you just make a, a low molecular weight chemical that's specific for the tyrosine kinase domain of the ABLE protein. And when I draw this bilobe structure, I mean, this bilobe structure is carried here within the S. H1 domain right here. So this has a bilobed structure. It's obviously not indicated here in this very schematic drawing. The problem with that is the following. All of the SH1 domains, all of the tyrosine kinase domains, are evolutionarily closely related to one another. They're all derived from a precursor uh, tyrosine kinase domain that probably existed maybe six or 700 million years ago and has, as a consequence of gene duplication, been di diversified to make 90 different tyrosine kinases. And if you look under X-ray crystallography at the three-dimensional structure of all these tyrosine kinases, they all pretty much look like this, i.e., they all have rather similar catalytic clefts because they diverge from a common ancestral protein and they've retained this three-dimensional configuration because this three-dimensional configuration seems to be important for the retention of their function. You can imagine, conversely, that if there were some descendants of the ancestral tyrosine kinase domain that somehow became mutant and lost its three-dimensional structure, those descendant kinases would lose their ability to phosphorylate tyrosines on substrate proteins and therefore would be eliminated from the gene pool because they would have been defective. And that explains the strong conservatism in the structure of these 90 different enzymes. They all look very similar to one another, and that creates a great difficulty for the drug developer, because a, uh, a low molecular weight drug, which one would like to develop, that fits in here. So here I'll draw a low molecular weight drug that interacts in a stereospecific fashion with the amino acid residues that are lining this pocket, this catalytic cleft, might bind and, and nicely inactivate the uh, tyrosine kinase domain of ABLE. But at the same time, it might also bind and inactivate a whole series of other tyrosine kinases, and that in turn could lead to therapeutic disaster. For instance, you could treat a, uh, if you had a non-selective agent, you could treat a um, chronic myelogenous leukemia patient with a low molecular weight inhibitor, a, a low molecular weight compound, which would get into this pocket of the BCR able protein, but it might similarly get into the catalytic cleft of the EGF receptor. And if it shut down the EGF receptor, it might cause a fatal diarrhea because after all, the EGF receptor, I will tell you, is needed to maintain the structure of the epithelial lining of the colon. And so you might kill the patient simply because uh, you had deprived the cells of that person in that per person's colon of their ability to maintain themselves. There are a whole series of growth factor receptors that are required for hematopoiesis that we discussed last time. And there, once again, if you have had a non-selective compound which got into the uh, domain of one of the growth factor receptors that is responsible for hematopoiesis, you might shut down the entire bone marrow and once again kill the patient. I'm just giving you those as overly dramatic examples of the fact that selectivity is an extremely important consideration in developing such a drug. The other thing is, is um, um, affinity for the... affinity for the uh, target, uh, for the uh, 
domain, uh, the calorie cleft that is being targeted. What do I mean by affinity? If you look at the um, dose response curves of uh, various compounds, what you see is the following. You can draw out a line that looks like this, a graph that looks like this, where here we have log of drug concentration. And here we have, so here is 10 to the minus uh, 4. Here, let's, let's do the other. 10 to the minus 8 molar, 10 to the minus 7 molar, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4. And this is molar drug concentration. And here is the percentage of inhibition. Let's say, for example, we were able to take the BCR able protein and study it in a test tube. And let's say we were interested in studying how well its tyrosine kinase activity responded to an applied drug that we developed against it. So here's percentage of inhibition of tyrosine kinase activity of BCR able protein. Now, I might be able to develop a drug whose dose response curve would look like this. And you'll say, well, that's terrific. That's a drug which shuts down BCR able. We haven't even dealt with the issue of selectivity, but let's look at where one begins to see a dose response. Right here, 10 to the minus 5 molar. And if you calculate back as to how much of the drug you need to deliver, in order to shut down the BCR able protein in, in a patient, the size of the pill they'd have to get would probably be this big every day. So what you need to do is you need to be a, an acceptable range of drug concentrations is down in this area here. And therefore, only until you get a drug which has a dose response curve that looks like this, which is two or three orders of magnitude more potent, where it's able to shut down the kinase activity already, at 10 to the minus seventh in a, what this is called a sub-micromolar concentration. Micromolar is 10 to the minus sixth. Here already at a, at a tenth of a micromolar, 10 to the minus seventh molar, we're already getting a shutdown of the enzyme function. And if one can do that, then one might in principle be able to develop a pill that's this big and give that to the patient rather than a pill that's the size of a football. And by the way, if you have to make lots of a very complex organic molecule through organic synthesis that has an affinity of this, it's also very expensive. Obviously, if you can make a compound that's a hundredfold more potent and requires a hundredfold less material to deliver to the patient body, then uh, you might have some, some success in, in treating the patient. Here's another issue. So we've talked about selectivity. We've talked about potency or affinity, affinity for the substrate or potency. So this would be an acceptable drug. It works already at 10 to the minus 7th molar concentration, where the inflection point of this curve is. This is an unacceptable drug at 10 to the minus 5. We can also talk about pharmacokinetics. I want to give you a feeling for how complex drug development is and why it so rarely succeeds. By the way, you know how much it costs to develop a drug that's useful in the clinic these days and test it on people? Anybody have any idea? How much? Billion. Yeah, it's pretty close to a billion, between 900 million and a billion. That's a lot of money. That's more money than you and I are going to earn together. All of us, maybe, in a lifetime. Okay, anyhow, pharmacokinetics. Well, what's pharmacokinetics? Glad I asked that question. How long does the drug stay inside of you after you take it, if you're a cancer patient? What happens if the drug is, sec is secreted, uh, excreted by the kidneys? within minutes of uh, its being uh, taken, let's say either by injection or orally. So here we can imagine, let's talk about drug concentration. Here's, I'll use the word drug concentration in uh, blood. And here's time. And here's what some drugs look like when you give them, let's say, orally. Here's what they look like. 
So here's, let's say here's the effective drug concentration. The effective concentration. And we know the effective concentration from doing measurements like this. We just measure, work that out. So let's say we, we develop a drug which is able to hit the BCR able protein. What are the kinetics with which uh, the uh, drug becomes soluble in, in the bloodstream? And it might look like this, where I'm drawing here now, this is one hour, this is two hours, this is three hours, four hours. Is that long enough? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you're going to try to kill a cancer cell, and that's what the name of this game is, you want to have it around for a while. Because it turns out, as one learned, the continued viability of the CML cancer cells, of the leukemia cells, was dependent on the continued firing by the BCR-able kinase protein. In fact, as one learned, if one shut off firing by the tyrosine kinase um, molecule in a chronic myelogenous leukemia cell, the cells would implode. They would undergo apoptosis. So this began to reveal that, in fact, the bcr able protein is not only responsible for forcing these cells to proliferate, but it also independently provides them with an anti-apoptotic signal. It keeps them from falling over the cliff into apoptosis. It keeps them from killing themselves. And that's obviously critical for uh, the ability of this tumor to proliferate, for the number of cells to expand in the body of a patient. It turns out that if you provide these cancer cells with an effective way of shutting down their bcr able protein for 30 or 40 or 50 minutes, not much happens to them. You need to deprive them of the, the drug for a very long period of time, 12, 15, 20 hours. And therefore, you need pharmacokinetics that look like this. It needs to be present for an extended period of time, or even better, let me redraw that, even better look like this. It stays in the blood for an extended period of time. Some drugs stay in the circulation for a long time. Other drugs stay in the circulation for a very short period of time. There's another problem, which we haven't even begun to talk about, and that is the metabolism of the drug. It turns out that many drugs that you give a patient are rapidly converted by the enzymes in the liver, which are normally responsible for detoxifying chemicals that come into our body. And therefore, many of the drugs that come into our bodies are, with greater or lesser speed, altered into something else, detoxified, and therefore rendered innocuous. Now you'll say, well, you can figure that out too, but here's an additional fly in the ointment. Because we are a polymorphic population, because we humans are genetically heterogeneous one from the other, some of us metabolize a given drug much more rapidly than others do. And here we have a situation where um, potentially most of us might metabolize a drug very quickly, in which case the uh, physicians would want to give us a very high dose of the drug so that we have a, enough of the drug around for a long enough period of time to do some effect. So let's say that 97% of us um, are able to metabolize the drug very quickly, and as a consequence, we're given a very high dosage in order to have some effective dosage reaching the tumor to compensate for the fact that much of this drug is rapidly eliminated by metabolism in the liver. It's interconverted into another chemically innocuous compound. Well, you'll say, that's good. That's, we'll just take a large dose of that compound. But let's think about the other 3% in the population who metabolize this compound very slowly. Like the other 97%, these individuals will be given a high dose of the drug because experience shows that in general, human, human beings, most human beings metabolize the drug very quickly. But these individuals metabolize the drug very slowly. And what's going to happen to them? Well, they might croak. Why? Because that drug is going to be around in potent, biologically active form for an extended period of time in their bodies and might have in them a lethal outcome. So therefore, we have to deal with the, the, the effects of variability in drug metabolism. Variability in metabolism, because it turns out that different people metabolize the drug differently. And that variability in drug metabolism is 
vastly greater if you compare the way we metabolize drugs to the way we compare to, to the, way, the way that laboratory mice metabolize drugs. Well, you'll say, why should we care about how uh, laboratory mice metabolize this or that drug? Why is it important? The fact is, the first tryouts of a candidate drug are tried out in laboratory mice, where laboratory mice are given a tumor and they're injected with um, the drug to see whether the tumor begins to shrink. But if, the, if it's the case that the laboratory mice metabolize a drug in a vastly different way than do humans, then the outcome of working with laboratory mice might be um, enormously misleading. And these are just some of the, the problems that, uh, uh, that bedevil the development of a drug. In any case, around 1994, at a company which was a precursor of Novartis, it was called Siba Geigi in uh, Basel, Switzerland, they developed a highly specific and potent anti-able low molecular weight uh, compound which uh, came to be called Gleevec. Or in Europe it's called <laughs> Gleevec. It's also pronounced Gleevec, but it's spelled differently. In fact, it was one of the other difficulties of developing this drug was the following. The higher ups in the drug company <clears throat> that were paying for this research <coughs> wanted on repeated occasion <coughs> excuse me, to scrub this entire drug development program. Why? Because the number of cases of chronic myelogenous leukemia overall worldwide is relatively small. How many are in this country every year? I don't know, 10 or 15,000. So the question was, economically, economically speaking, would the relatively small number of ca cases of this disease justify their investing a billion dollars in the development of the drug. Maybe it would take them a generation to get any payback from their initial investment. And so they tried time after time, time and again, to shut down this development program because it didn't seem to have any clear long-term economic benefit. Of course, now we're not talking about biology, we're talking about economics. Um, <clears throat> and rational economics, this is not avarice on, on their part, a drug company like that cannot go on spending a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there without at one point or another leading to a major financial hemorrhage. So Gleevec turned out to be highly specific for the ABLE kinase and, as it turned out, for two other kinds of kinases as well. Another kind of kinase it's, is against a, a tyrosine kinase receptor called called uh, KIT, this is a receptor tyrosine kinase, and another receptor kinase, tyrosine kinase called the PDGF receptor, which we've pa also encountered in passing earlier. These two other uh, growth factor receptors, KIT and the PDGF receptor, also have tyrosine kinase domains. They therefore follow this overall structural plan here. And it turns out by evolutionary quirk that the structures of their tyrosine kinase domains are actually similar in certain ways to the tyrosine kinase domain of, um, of ABLE, and therefore of BCR ABLE. So in fact, they didn't actually have a totally specific drug which would attack only one out of the 90 tyrosine kinases encoded in their genome. It attacked three of the uh, 90 tyrosine kinases, the ABLE, the KIT, and the PDGF receptor. And this might on its own have already proven to be the death knell for the uh, protein, except they began to try it out for patients and they saw some rem remarkably um, remarkable responses. It turned out that the great majority of CML patients who uh, were treated with um, Gleevec at therapeutic concentrations ended up having a rapid remission of their chronic myelogenous leukemia disease, which ultimately um, <clears throat> resulted in their being outwardly free of the disease. This is your question of the day. So Gleevec 
Gluvec goes into the catalytic cleft of the, of the able tyrosine kinase. It blocks the ATP binding site, because keep in mind that, that these enzymes need to grab the gamma phosphide off of ATP and transfer it to a protein substrate. And it does so because it hydrogen bonds to the amino acids which are lining this catalytic cleft. In other words, this catalytic cleft up here is, is it's obviously made of amino acids. And there are hydrogen bonds which Gleevec can form with the uh, amino acid residues that you're lining on both sides of the cleft. I should have brought you a picture of that. And a similar kind of hydrogen bonding can occur with the amino acids that are lining the catalytic clefts of um, the PDGF receptor and KIT. And that hydrogen bonding can occur already uh, at concentrations that are sub-micromolar, less than 10 to the minus 6 molar, 10 to the minus 7, even sometimes 10 to the minus 8 molar under certain conditions. So it's a, highly, it's a high affinity binding, it's, and it's relatively specific. Only three out of the 90 different kinases are, um, are bound. We can do the following kind of experiment. If I were to add Gleevec <coughs> uh, to uh, cells with BCR able function, this is, the, this is the response that BCR able would show. Here is the response that the EGF receptor would show. So if I, if I dose the patient at this concentration of drug, Gleevec will, be sh will shut down the, the BCR able protein but it won't shut down the EGF receptor, which requires vastly higher concentrations of drug in order to shut down uh, its tyrosine kinase domain. And here, here, right here, we can see what we know by as what we call selectivity. The fact that this enzyme responds at very low drug concentration, this enzyme, EGF receptor, and its tyrosine kinase, it's a growth factor receptor once again, requires vastly higher concentrations of drug in order to elicit an outcome. So what happened to the uh, chronic myelitis leukemia patients? The great majority of them, between 70 and 80 percent, had a miraculous collapse of their disease. In most cases, this disease could be uh, monitored microscopically. One could look for the immature myeloid cells in their blood and see that where they were previously present in vast numbers, they were microscopically now indetectable. However, in those patients where the disease seemed to collapse, one could still use the PCR test to demonstrate there were residual cancer cells in their blood. How could one do that? Well, let's imagine that here is the, the BCR able fusion protein. So here's, the, here's BCR, and here's able over here. You can make PCR primers, one of which is specific for a BCR sequence, and the other of which is specific for an ABLE sequence. And the only time that you'll get a PCR product is if these two sequences exist on the same messenger RNA molecule and uh, that's reverse transcribed into a cDNA. You could even do this from genomic DNA as well. And so one can specifically detect, using this PCR test, the presence of cells which have this chromosomal translocation. If one of the PCR primers is against BCR and the other is able, and the distances between these two primers is not too far away, not more than, let's say, a kilobase, so you get rather efficient PCR amplification. So it turned out that the great majority of patients who were cytologically cured Cytology means a cytological analysis represents what you see through a microscope. So these patients, if you looked at a smear of their blood, cytologically they were cured. But if you used PCR analysis, which is far more sensitive, one could detect residual cancer cells that might be present in one out of ten to the fifth, or one out of ten to the sixth cells moving around in the circulation, which are almost invisible uh, if you're looking through a very complex mixture of, red, of uh, cells through the light microscope. And so what happened was that uh, patients began to relapse. And after a period of several years, a, a number of patients began to show a restoration of their CML condition. In fact, uh, in one re recent European study indicates 
that between 10 and 12 percent of the CML patients who are treated with Gliebeck relapse every year. What do I mean by relapse? I mean they, they show a resurgence of their disease. The disease comes back to life and they once again have the disease. And interestingly enough, if one now looks at their cancer cells, what do you see? In virtually every case, you see some alteration in the BCR able protein. In some, in the great majority of instances, you see, <coughs> you see uh, uh, point mutations, point mutations that affect amino acid residues lining the cavity here, lining the cavity of the, uh, of the uh, able kinase protein. Those uh, amino acid substitutions do not compromise the tyrosine kinase activity of this enzyme but they do prevent Gleevec from binding. And as a consequence, now you begin to have patients whose tumors are no longer responsive to Gleevec. And what's happened now is one has developed a new generation of compounds which binds into this pocket, even in the presence of these amino acid substitutions, to retreat these patients. See you on Wednesday.